Our pendulum problem is that we remember on one side or the other, but we don't remember both together. Again, we're going to talk about the pendulum. We're going to talk about yes or no. There's two swings of the pendulum. And we're also going to talk about yes and no, because there's a lot to this, and we can't cover it all in one hour or two hours or three hours. This is a huge system, and there are many different levels in this system. Our job is to continually refine each idea until we can get a better understanding of it, a more in-depth understanding of it, and we can bring it more deeply into our own internal world, make it more practical, more experiential. We start off at a very surface level, intellectually hearing this or reading this and agreeing, giving intellectual assent to it. That's not the same thing as getting it inside of you and owning it. We want to own it, and the only way to own it is to eat it and assimilate it. Like Jesus really freaked people out when he said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood. And they, Whoa! And they were all Jews. And they were like, Ew, drink blood, that's horrible. Eat another person's body, that's horrible. They took it literally way on the outside surface level. But he was talking about something in a much, much deeper way. Unless you take these teachings, the body of my teachings, the life of my teachings, the blood, the life of my teachings, unless you take this and eat it and assimilate it and digest it and make it a part of your being, you're not going to make it. That's really what he was saying. Well, of course, you can't tell people that because they have to have something inside in order to hear that. People who live on the circumference of themselves, on the surface of themselves, they can't even hear that because they have no apparatus for receiving something in that way. They have no way to deal with fuel that's that refined. There are different kinds of fuel, and fuel that's very coarse is easy to hear. It's easy to burn. It's easy to deal with. What's that? It's a piece of wood. Light it. It gives you heat and light. What's that? Well, that is a gas. Well, I can't see it. Yes, but it still will light. So they put a smell in gas so that you know because you can't see it and you can't smell it. So they put a smell in it so that if there's a gas leak, you smell it because it's flammable and it's explosive. And if you don't know that it's filling your house, it could kill you or it could hit a spark or a flame and blow the place up. So it's different kinds of fuel. You can see a piece of wood. You can hold a piece of wood. You can burn a piece of wood. Well, you can also burn gas. It's a different kind of fuel, more refined fuel. We're talking about more refined hydrogens. We're talking about higher hydrogens here. We're not talking about hydrogen 48, which is a common fuel source. We're talking about hydrogens 24 and 12, where the fuel source is much more refined, but you've got to have what it takes to burn it. You know, anybody can take a piece of wood and burn it. You can hold it in your hand. You can hold a burning piece of wood in your hand. You can't hold burning gas in your hand. You've got to have some other way to deal with that. And so we're talking about things like that. So our pendulum problem is that we remember on one side or the other, but we can't remember both together. And what we have to do is we have to develop a place in ourselves where we can remember both things together, both extremes together, both sides of the pendulum swing together. That's our only hope. We have no middle, so we need to create, make, develop, a middle, build a middle. When we're negative, we remember unpleasant things. I told, I told you that a couple weeks ago. When we're negative, we remember unpleasant things. We don't remember pleasant things. When we're in love and happy, we remember pleasant things. We don't remember unpleasant things. Actors use this as a trick. They need to cry or something so they remember something unpleasant, and then that will get them in the mood to cry or whatever it is they need to do. We've got to see for ourselves how we swing between the opposites in the intellectual, the emotional, and the instinctive centers. It's not enough for me to tell you this. It doesn't do that much good for me to tell you this. You've got to be able to see this yourself. You've got to be able to take this inside of you. You've got to be able to take this, the body of this teaching, the blood of this teaching, the flesh of this teaching, the life of this teaching. You've got to be able to eat it and drink it and assimilate it, and digest it, and make it part of so that it goes into your cells, so that it goes into your bone marrow, so that it goes into your body, so that it goes into your consciousness, so that it goes into you deeply and becomes a part of you. It becomes a part of the fiber of your being. Have you taken in impressions of one another from a negative swing of the pendulum without trying to remember the opposite impressions from other times when you weren't negative about the person? 
Yeah, we can all nod our heads about this, can't we? Yes, we have all looked at one another and been negative, taken in negative impressions, and not remembered, geez, it's amazing. He was my friend last week, and now I would like to scratch his eyes out. But can you see the, the great need for that? When we're negative, more than any other time, we need to be remembering, you know, it wasn't that long ago I had eyes that just love this person. Where are they now? How can I bring both of these things together? and form some kind of middle ground where I am more sensible. Do you see how it's so unbalanced, it's so crazy on the negative swing or the positive swing, either one. Well, I'd rather be positive. Well, maybe you would rather be positive, but it's no different. It's still unbalanced. You need to be balanced. You need to be centered. You need to have them both together because every time you're positive, well, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. What does that mean? It means that every time you're positive, you are going to be equally the opposite. So you're going to be equally negative with the same intensity. Intensity is a good thing, but intensity on this swing of the pendulum, intensity on that swing of the pendulum, that's not so good. What we're looking for is intensity in the middle, intensity in the moment, intensity of awakeness, intensity of consciousness, where we can be right here, right now, with intensity, with power, with presence. We've got to bring the opposites together consciously. This isn't something that's going to happen mechanically. This isn't something that just doesn't. And how do you know that? Well, look at you. Here you are. You've made it this far in life, and you can't do it. At will, you cannot do it. You can't even remember to do it, let alone do it. You can't even remember to do it. Oh, so you're negative. Well, try to remember yourself. Screw you. What do you do? Leave me alone. I'm being negative right now. Do you see what he did to me? He really deserves this. Blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. What about you? You have the right not to be negative. Huh? You have the right not to be negative. Yeah, but I am negative. Yes, but you have the right not to be. Oh, oh, you're talking about that work stuff again, right? Yes, right. I'm talking about that work stuff again. You can rely on me to, to talk about that work stuff again. Well, you're irritating me with that. Yes, well, what are you doing here then? Well, I came here to be irritated so I could be negative. Okay, well, you're in the right place. <laughs> so in order to do this, though, we need a work memory which only arises through self-observation. Oh, what a surprise. Here we are back to self-observation. In order to get a work memory, in order to build, in order to develop, in order to have a work memory, it's like an island submerged. But in order to raise it, you've got to have self-observation, and that brings it up. So see, our middle, everybody has a middle because everybody has a pendulum swing. So if it swings from this side to this side, in order to get there, it has to pass over a middle ground. <laughs> there has to be a middle. The problem with us is we are unconscious during that middle part of the swing. We're conscious at this end, and we're conscious at this end, and then we're unconscious in this middle part. When we don't know anything about it, there are a couple of reasons for that, and we'll talk about that. Every thought or feeling comes into the consciousness has opposites. When you identify with it, you're under its power, and you're on the pendulum. I don't care what kind of thought or feeling you have. It's got an opposite. It does. Everything has an opposite. The problem with us is we don't understand that if we're having one, we're going to have the other because it's a law. That pendulum has to swing. Well, why does it have to swing? Why is that so predictable? Physically, it's predictable because of the laws of physics. Psychologically, it's predictable because of psychic laws, inner laws, laws that govern our being, what we are, what we're like. And it's just as predictable. For every thought or feeling that comes into the consciousness, there's going to be an opposite. When you identify with either one, you are under the power of that which you are identifying with, and you are on the pendulum. Just imagine this huge clock, this big clock, with a pendulum that's got like a fire pole for the upright part. And you could actually hold on to it and stand on the big round weight at the bottom. Every time you identify, what you're doing is you're grabbing hold of that. You're standing on that, and then you're swinging with that. You're swinging so fast that when you are at this end of the pendulum, it's the slowest part. Just before it starts to go back, it's the slowest part. Isn't that interesting? That's so slow that even we could be aware of that. <laughs> then you get to the other side, and as it starts to swing down toward the middle, it picks up speed, doesn't it? It really starts moving, and we go unconscious. It's just so fast, we don't have the hydrogens, we don't have the ability to deal with that kind of fuel. We just don't have what it takes. We haven't developed 
the mechanism inside of ourselves. We haven't developed our machine to the point where we can burn that kind of fuel yet. So we go through that unconscious. But we get to the other side when it starts to peak up. As it starts to go up, you notice it slows down. The higher it goes, it slows, it slows, it slows until it finally stops for, us for an instant, and then it starts back down again. When it's at that side then, we're aware again. It's magic. Suddenly we're aware again because it's slow enough for us to see it. Imagine hummingbird wings. You've seen time-lapse photography and you've seen video or, or film where they've slowed down the hummingbird wings. How many beats per second of hummingbird wings? It's like, it's incredible. You can't see it, it's just a blur to you. But when you slow it down, you see that it's there. Well, why couldn't I see it? You're just not equipped. Your brain just is not equipped for that. So does that mean it's impossible to see it? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means that we have not developed the ability to do that. And there's really very little point in developing the ability to do that, actually. Now, who has developed the ability to do that? Well, my guess is that there are people who could do it a lot better than us. People who have to keep their eye on the ball, athletes who play tennis or baseball or ping pong or whatever, where something's moving quickly and they've got to see it. You've got to admit, they can see things we can't see. You've got to admit, they can react to things that we can't react to because we have not developed the potential that we have inside of ourselves. Makes sense, doesn't it? Good, that's all I want to do is make sense. I don't want to belabor the point. I just want you to move with me on this. And I want to make sure that each step of the way, you've got pretty firm footing so that you can take the next step. You don't have to go back and say, well, wait a second, I don't know about that. You'll find yourself having the opposite thought or feeling without seeing the contradiction. We don't see our contradictions. This is our state. Our state, our condition is we do not see our contradictions. If you could see your contradictions, you wouldn't rag on me about things that you see me do that you don't like, that you do the same thing. Well, how come you can be critical of me about it? Well, because you don't see it in you. If you could see it in you, you wouldn't be critical about it. Well, he's not that critical and not that superior and not that uppity about it and not that angry about it. You would have a little more understanding, a little more compassion, wouldn't you? You could see it in yourself. Then when you looked at it in someone else, you'd be more compassionate. You would think, well, geez, I've done that a lot. I understand that. That makes a lot of sense. I understand how you can do that. That's a drag. I don't like it, but I don't like it when I do it either. It's just so hard to be noxious when you have compassion. And compassion comes from understanding. And understanding comes from knowing yourself, understanding yourself. It doesn't come from a can of Campbell's soup. It doesn't come from a box of Lipton's. It comes from understanding yourself, and understanding yourself only comes from self-observation. So this middle ground has to arise through self-observation. And if you're not observing yourself, you're not getting any middle ground. If you're not getting any middle ground, you're also not getting any understanding of yourself. And if you're not getting any understanding of yourself, you're not understanding other people. And if you're not understanding other people, you're not being compassionate. And if you're not being compassionate, what good are you? Well, what, the world needs more nitwits? The world needs more murderers. The world needs more brutal road rage people. The world needs more ignorant people who don't get their way and want to crack skulls over it. The world needs more of that. I don't think so. You need more of that? No, that's not why you're here. You're here because you've realized, to some degree, that you need less of that in your life and that there's something that you might be able to do about it if you're willing to make the effort. Ospensky said, we work with too slow a hydrogen to notice the middle where the pendulum swings the fastest. The slowest is at either end passing the middle very quickly. We've got to learn to rule our minds. It takes a long time and a lot of effort, but we've got to learn to rule our minds. As it is now, we control nothing within ourselves. <coughs> what do you mean? I, I can... Did you feel something inside of you? If you're paying attention, you'll feel something inside of yourself. You'll notice something inside of yourself doesn't like that. What do you mean? Uh, and it comes up with ways that it can control, that it thinks it can control. It's imagination, pride, and vanity. That's the holy trinity of false personality. <laughs> pride, vanity, and imagination. We worship the three in one, you know, the god of false personality. I know that's probably not in any of the books, and I know that Gurdjieff himself didn't say that, but you know what? This system, if you follow it, you will get an understanding. And if you get an understanding, then you'll be able to bring out new things from that. But you will still know where its basis is, what it comes from. You, know, you can still verify that. Pride, vanity, and imagination. Those three things are the holy trinity of the false personality. It's the religion of the false personality. It's the three gods in one. When we begin to observe ourselves, we soon realize we rule nothing. 
We control nothing. Thoughts come to us. That's it. Thoughts come to us. Any thought can come to you any time. Any thought. Back in the 70s, late 70s, I did EST, Earhart Seminar Training. Now people don't even know what that is. But it was a big deal back then. They had movies about it and everything. And it was a big rage. And Werner Earhart made millions. And well, there were all kinds of spin-offs, Life Spring and Relation Shop and things like that. One of the things that the trainers had to do is they, if they were in a relationship with somebody and they uh, had some thought, so they'd do this big training and be 450 people, 350 people, 500 people in a room. This guy trainer would see this girl and he'd go hubba hubba, you know, and she's really hot and he'd have all kinds of thoughts about her. Then he would have to call his, that night he would have to call his partner and tell his partner all the thoughts that he had. The reason they did this was to diffuse any potential situations. He would have to say, well, I had this thought, I had that thought. People who were not trained in that couldn't deal with it. Your husband or wife called you up and told you what they thought about somebody at work. <laughs> you want to kill them <laughs> because we're not trained, because we don't understand. Anybody can have any thought. But you let, you let it. No, you don't understand. Anybody can have any thought. Entertaining the thought is an entirely different matter. But anybody can have any thought. Anything can enter your mind. Any feeling can enter your heart. That's the truth about us, because we don't have any gates. We don't have a fence. There's nothing to stop it. What we do have, if we work, is a little bit of awareness to say yes or no to things, to thoughts and to feelings that come in. Sometimes thoughts and feelings come to us like a swarm of bees. We take them as ours, saying yes to the whole swarm, just as if they were true. They just, they're here. We go, yeah, that's how I feel. Oh, yeah, that's what I think. As if they were true. We don't inspect them to find out if they're Africanized bees or European bees or Italian honey bees or what they are. We don't look at them closely. We don't look at them to see if they have mites, if they're healthy or not healthy. It's just a swarm of bees. They're on us and it's like, whoa. And then it makes us do whatever it makes us do. Have you ever seen anybody with a swarm of bees on them? There are two kinds of people. The people who just stand there and, they, you know, they get this swarm of bees on them. It's like a big beard. They just hang there. And then the other people who go crazy and swat and run ah, and scream. Which do you think we are? <laughs> right. Okay. Well, good. At least you got to look. They're not you. You don't need to believe them. You don't need to go with them. And you don't have to take them as true. What am I talking about? I'm not talking about bees. I'm talking about thoughts and feelings. They're not you. You don't need to take them as you. You don't need to believe them. And you don't need to go with them. What a concept. Any thought of any kind can come to you at any moment. If we're not awake, it will convince us. It will be our thought. How many thoughts came into your head and they were your thoughts suddenly? Suddenly you just own it. It's my, it's my thought. I think. I feel. It's a thought. It's a feeling. It just came in. Just like if you left the window open and a couple of bees flew in. Well, they're my bees now. Well, why are they your bees? Well, they're in my house. Open another window. They'll fly out. Well, but I like them. They're good bees. All right, until one of the bees stings somebody in your house. Then they want to sue you. Well, this wasn't my bee. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're just so crazy. Think about it. Well, there's a phrase in the work. A person is listening to his thoughts. You look at somebody and go, that guy's listening to his thoughts. You get the taste of it. You know when you're listening to your thoughts. You can see people listening to their thoughts. I looked at Daniel just a few minutes ago. He was listening to his thoughts. Oh, he was very upset with Jess. He's making me sit over here. How dare he? This isn't right. I don't like this. Sound familiar, Daniel? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Good. He's going to be honest about it. See, that's the great thing about being a kid. Yep, busted. You got me. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking those thoughts. How'd you know that? Well, because I could see that you were listening to your thoughts. Are we listening to our thoughts or are we being our thoughts? Because there was no difference. When I looked at Daniel, he was being his thought. He was negative. He was glaring, turning away, very unhappy because Jess made him do something. And it's like, nobody can make me do anything. Who does he think he is? We get all crazy and resistant because we have these thoughts and we think there are thoughts. We have these feelings, we think there are feelings. And then we become them. So I wonder if a person is listening to his thoughts or if he is being his thoughts. This is compliments of Maurice Nicole who made this distinction between the two. And I think he's right. He said he thought that people were being their thoughts, not listening to them. This is being a machine. The mind rules us and thoughts make us think them. We don't have any choice about it. 
My mind's not ruling me. I think this. It's my mind and I think this. Mm -hmm. Well, fine. Think the opposite. Why would I do that? That's stupid. Just as an experiment in how powerful you are. Oh, I can think that any time, right? Well, now we know about your imagination. If we haven't practiced inner attention, we won't see thoughts coming until the swarm is already upon us. If you haven't practiced inner attention, if you haven't practiced inside of yourself, attentive, detached self-observation, observing what's going on inside of you as if it were an interesting stranger, with curiosity, with a lot of curiosity. Well, look at that. Isn't that curious? Look at him. Look at what it's doing now. Look at what it's thinking now. Look at what it's feeling now. Isn't that interesting? That's all. No attachment. Oh, I think this. I feel that. Whoa. None of that. Back away from all that. When you do that, when you start to have that kind of inner attention, inner self-observation, you gain something that you did not have before. That is the ability to not try trust your mind. But until we do that, we won't be able to bring the opposite thoughts and feelings together consciously without some distinct memories recorded in work memory. It's not going to happen. What is work memory? Work memory is that which is recorded when you are being attentive in an inner way, when you are observing, when you are being conscious of yourself and the work at the same time in a detached way as if you were observing an interesting stranger. You develop a memory, and once you start to get a little bit of memory, then when something comes up, you go, oh, I remember this. <laughs> I remember this. This is not a good thing. You know, I don't have to go with this. This isn't me. I don't have to go there. And then you have something. Then you have a little tiny itty bitty ability to do something. Not much, but a little. You have the ability to say, no, this isn't me. That's not I. That's a lot. It doesn't look like a lot of movement in the violin case, but a little bit can make a big difference. And then we have to start off with a little bit. We do what we can do. We don't do what we can't do. Remember that you appreciate some things in a person when you're not negative with that person. This is yes and no, not yes or no. See, when you are angry with me, when I've touched one of your sacred cows that are annoyed with me, whatever you choose to call the intense rage that is covered by mild irritation or annoyance, whatever you choose to call it, and I don't care what you choose to call it, but when you're there, when you're negative about me, that's the time that you need to remember when you were the most positive about me. The other day I was thinking, isn't it funny, Tori wrote one time, Sarah said to Tori, Mom, what do other people do without James? And she was just like so grateful that I was in her life that she couldn't even imagine what it was like for other people to not have somebody like me in their life. Oh, you were grateful too. Now, the both of them have to work hard to remember that because what they naturally have now is either negative or indifferent. And indifferent may as well be negative because it's unconscious. And so they have to consciously work to remember that. So that is what we're talking about here. We're talking about that kind of work memory where we develop a work memory. Well, why do that? Why should I do that? Well, you should do that because it's good for you, not because of me. I don't care what you think about me. What does that matter? You're going to think whatever you want to think. Actually, you're not even going to think what you want to think. You're going to think whatever blows through your mind, and that's going to change. So why should I be bothered with that? Well, I shouldn't, and I'm not. But you should, because you need to develop work memory, and because you need to learn to appreciate the things that you appreciated about a person when you were not negative, when you are negative, so that you can start to bring yes and no together and form a third thing. That is what this is about. To do this gradually limits the pendulum swing between liking and disliking. Can you see the benefit in this? Can you see the benefit in gradually limiting the swing of the pendulum so it doesn't go as far this way and it doesn't go as far that way until you can finally get it to where it's in the middle? So it's a gentle sway. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be static. It's not going to be static because we're not static. We're alive. All the impressions are coming in all the time. But we need to keep them balanced. We need to keep the smooth rhythm about life. We need to walk through life like an islander in the Caribbean, you know, with just a little sway, but relaxed, comfortable, barefoot, so that we're rooted to the earth, but with our head in the clouds, so that we can smell the good fresh air, so we can see the sun, so we can feel that breeze. And we need to move through life that way, consciously aware of the beauty all around us and the beauty within us.
This requires an inner awareness and alertness, not indifference. This is consciousness. Inner alertness, awareness is consciousness. Indifference is mechanical. I don't care. I don't care about that. That's just mechanical. Any machine can do that. Toasters cannot care about things. Televisions cannot care about things. Cars cannot care about things. That doesn't take any awareness. Well, that doesn't affect me. I don't care about that. That's mechanical, pure and simple. But to be conscious, that's an entirely different matter. To be aware, to be alert, that's an entirely different matter. That takes effort. When you don't go with the thought, you're free from it for the moment. See, you have a thought comes into your head, but you don't go with it. You don't say I to it. You don't jump on its back and ride it around like a wild bronco. I'm going to control my thoughts. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> you're not going to control your thoughts any more than you're going to control a wild bull. Thought control is ridiculous. Don't waste your time doing that. Here's how you can control your thoughts. You can say yes to thoughts. You can say no to thoughts. But you're not going to jump on them, put a bit and bridle in their mouth, and then leave them where you want them to go. That's not going to happen. Not at our stage, anyway. Perhaps later, but we're not talking about later. Let's talk about what we can do. What we might be able to do is we might be able to stop identifying with every thought that comes in, every feeling that comes in. We might be able to do that. We might be able to say, that's not my thought. I don't know where that came from, and I don't have to do anything about it. But it keeps coming back. I have this tune in my head and it won't get out. Oh, and it's your fault. You put it there. That's what I mean. We have no control. Where should the force go when it's freed? The force that would have gone into that thought, where should it go when it's freed? Self-remembering, Pat says. What do you think? Any nods of agreement? Well, I was thinking if you're saying a thought, then to go to the opposite and bring that thought in with it, what you're just saying. So if you have a dislike, not grab that dislike, but hold that on one hand while you look for the other one and bring it in. Actually, you don't have to hold it. When a thought comes in, you can't really hold it or not hold it. You can either be it or not be it. If you can own it or not own it, you identify with it or you don't identify with it. Or to be more accurate, we identify or we identify less, to be more accurate. So you don't have to hold it. And if you can bring up the other, if you can remember the work, but isn't that really what Pat said? In order to do that, to bring the other, don't you have to send that force to remembering? So the force that would have gone into that thought now goes into self-remembering. So then you can bring up its opposite. So the two really work together. But there's a step that you missed that she caught. First, you must take that force and put it into self-remembering. Put it into interattentiveness. Because you've got some force if you didn't go with a thought. You were free from that thought for the moment. Then that force should pass in the direction of real I. We attempt to remember ourselves because we have no real I. If we had a real I, we wouldn't have to remember ourselves. We would be real I. But as we are now, all we are is false personality. All we are is this acquired stuff. So we try to remember ourselves. Well, what does that mean? I try to remember what I haven't acquired. Well, what's that? Well, I don't know yet. But if I can stop putting all my force into what I've acquired, perhaps I'll discover it. Perhaps the work will draw me to it because the work comes from the conscious circle of humanity or people who have realized real I. So they know what real I is. So they give us this system and they say, look, this system will lead you to us. Where are we? Well, we are awake. The system will lead you out of your prison of dreams into a waking state, into a more conscious state. You can be more conscious, you can be less conscious, you can be more awake, you can be less awake. This work will lead you to becoming more awake, to becoming more conscious, to becoming more real. We can't get an experience of real eye without a certain emotional state. This emotional state, Maurice Nicole called valuation of the work. When you evaluate the work and you value it as something more valuable than everything else, you have valuation for the work. When you've got that, there's a certain emotional state that comes with that. I get very emotional about this work because it's precious to me because my time is short. You've got forever. I don't. You know, my end is in sight. I can see the horizon. I can see the pinpoint on the horizon now that is my death. You don't. You don't see that. And you don't want to see it. You're not even looking in that direction. I want to see it. I want to focus on it because that's where I'm going. And I've got certain things I need to have done before I get there. So as long as I'm gauging how long it's going to take me to get there, which could be the next 15 minutes, there are things that I need to be doing right now so that when I do get there, I will be ready. 
When we work without wonder, we work with small eyes and the small parts of centers, small eyes that can't contact higher centers, a real eye. But when we work with a sense of wonder, with a sense of the miraculous of it all, it really is incredible. The fact that in this day and age, in this room, sit people who can study, think about, and make efforts about this work is a miracle. I know. I've been doing this for 36 or so years with people. This is rare. You don't find people who have been together for 20 plus years with the same thrust, the same cohesive element that has brought them together, still working on the same thing, moving in the same direction. No, we're not all in perfect step with each other, but that's okay. That's not the point. The point is we're still pointing in that direction. We're still paddling the boat, as it were, or we're still kicking, or we're still trying to get there. It's rare. We can't remember ourselves without a sense of something greater, greater mind. We can't attain real I if there's nothing above us. This is why a teacher in the work is important, not because a teacher is anybody or anything special. And don't subscribe to that. But we need a teacher to represent for us something higher, to represent for us another step that we could take. Because let's face it, the conscious circle of humanity is a lofty abstract idea. It's difficult to have any conceptualization of that. But if you've got a teacher who's trying to be more awake, who's trying to share with you ways of being more awake, you've got a direction, you've got something tangible that you can get hold of. It makes it easier. It's a smaller step. But you've got to believe in something greater. If you don't, this work is useless to you. Where are you going to go? If you're already the pinnacle, where's there to go? And if you're already the pinnacle, as some, and, and we all are in our own minds, if you're already the pinnacle, how sad is that? I mean, it doesn't get any sadder than that, does it? I don't think it does.